Welcome at the RIF, the, the Research Institute for Sustainability Helmholtz Center Potsdam. Welcome to the excellent scientists and carbon footprint policy experts from all over the world here in this room of Kleist Villa. And welcome everybody online at your screens. We have a special guest today. We are really honored to have Dr. Klaus Töpfer here, former federal minister for the environment, nature conservation and nuclear safety. And this is most important for this conference today, founding director and former executive direct director of the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies, IASS, former name of the RIF. So please welcome. Dr. Klaus Töpfer, we will listen to him and his opening speech in a minute. A big applause for him. Thank you for being here. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Julia Wissmann. I'm a journalist and I'm a science podcast host of two podcasts um, dealing with sustainability, climate change, biodiversity, circular economy, um, altogether the SDGs. And I'm honored and excited to be part of this great experience, um, the first Carbon Footprint Policy Accelerator Conference. Two days of knowledge exchange about carbon footprint policies as by clean and whole life carbon regulatory standards for buildings. I would like to mention Nino Jordan. He's, he just stand up. <laughs> Um, the Klaus Töpfer Sustainability Fellow of the RIFs, because he organized this conference. You all know him. A warm applause for Nino Jordan. As Associate Professor at University College London Institute for Sustain Sustainable Resources. But um, the official opening for this great conference um, will have uh, Professor Dr. Mark Lawrence, Scientific Director of the Riffs Helmholtz Center Potsdam. Please welcome Dr. Professor Dr. Mark Lawrence. <laughs> there is the microphone. Can I turn it on for you? So good morning, everybody. Thank you, Julia. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to RIFS. And uh, it's a wonderful pleasure, especially to welcome you at this workshop. I get to open many of our workshops that we have here, and it's always a pleasure to see what kinds of activities we have and what kinds of people we bring here together. Um, but this workshop, of course, brings together many of the threads of our past, and it's, it's, it's quite a pleasure in that sense. As Julia already mentioned, we have, as a, as a special guest, it's, it's my great pleasure that Klaus Töpfer has uh, joined us for the opening of this workshop. Klaus Töpfer, as mentioned, was the founding director of the IASS, the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies, which has now become RIFS, uh, back over 13 years ago, and uh, brought many, many valuable impulses into that. After Klaus left us in 2015, we initiated the Klaus Turp for Sustainability Fellowship. And uh, it took a while, given the pandemic and other things going, for that to really get rolling. But now we have our fourth Klaus Turp for Sustainability Fellow, Nino Jordan, here and uh, has organized this workshop, one of the threads that we've brought together, but also on the topic of this workshop, which about the 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 carbon footprint and the some um, for the finance sector, but especially about the building sector. And so, everybody knows of Klaus Töpfer's history as environmental minister. Many know of his history as environmental minister of Rhineland Faults with the famous swim in the Rhine. I actually still live in mines and commute to here, so this is something that's still prominent after all those years uh, sticks in people's memories. Um, and of course, his time as federal minister of environment and his time as the executive director of UNEP, but also Klaus spent some time as the building minister and uh, can bring that thread together here. But of course, to me, one of the most important threads is the fact that we bring together for the work that we do, not only academics, but people across all sectors of the society that are relevant, the policy sector, the industry sector, civil society sector, everyone that is relevant and needed for us to be able to approach problems in our either in our special transdisciplinary research manner that we typically take on or other co-creative approaches to solving policy problems that we have. And so 
with that, um, I welcome you all. I wish you great discussions. Unfortunately, I won't be able to stay very long for this workshop. I have to disappear off to a, uh, a general assembly of our former institute, the IASS, which still exists and is in the formal legal transition. And then this evening, we'll be together with Klaus Terpfer for an event together with him in Berlin. So he'll also be able to stay for a bit this morning. Um, but it's, it's a great opportunity for us to be here together. And we wish you a very, very successful workshop and discussions together. And with with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Klaus Terpfer and hand it over to him to say a few words of welcome and give you a few thoughts, imparting thoughts for this workshop. Klaus. Yeah, good morning, friends, colleagues. Way to be back in this building. You may imagine there are lots and lots of happening in the meantime. And I remember when we started here, it was not very easy to convince the German bureaucracy that we need something like a new kind of an institute, kind of an institute linked science to policy. And I think it is still a very, very open activity. And uh, I'm very sure that this will be more intensive than we ever considered it could be. All my business life, and I'm an old man, as you can easily see, I'm now 85 years old. So when you remember that your parents are most probably 20 years younger, then you know that I'm your grandfather. And uh, when I started, I started to study uh, economics at the university in Münster. And one of the specialty of this university there was the regional planning start. Hans Eisert and others, for those who are a little bit informed about this. It was a question, a very, very important question, how to influence private plans. My dissertation had this title, how to uh, inform and to change private plans, demonstrated as a locational decision between urban and rural areas. In the meantime, this booklet is gone. Not the third uh, uh, new uh, presentation. Anyhow, it was quite a good idea because how can we do this that we are going not all to the cities and the empty? all areas, as modern as it is quite now. See, we have uh, differentiated between uh, localization economies and uh, uh, urbanization economies. We try to influence and to make it clear what is to do that private business is reacting to those offers was very good. And by the way, one of the advantages we always considered was uh, it was better for lower emission regulations. And then came the time when Willy Brandt, in his campaign, mentioned he wants to see the blue sky on the Ruhr. Because there, in the Ruhr, district was very, very dirty, had very low life expectations. And what to do, that's not surprising, it was the center of the German montane industry with coal and steel. It was the power region in Europe, linked with or compared with Manchester and those in England. These were the two industrialization starters, but there was no emission, whatever. And 
from time to time it was nearly impossible to live there. And then Willy Brandt, the blue sky over the world. That was the vision. He said everybody was more or less laughing about that. How can you do that? You can go out of this and you may imagine industry in those days, private industry was very, very, very influential. Very influential. The Tissons and the Krupps and the others. All was this until now very well known in the ears of Germans, if you ask for the economic perspectives. And you have to convince them that they had to invest money to clean the air. And they were backed, of course, by the trade unions, because what you are investing there, you can give as a wages increase. So it was a fight not only against industry, quite the country, by the way, as we have it quite now as well. You see that when you listen now to the media, there's a huge discussion concerning the bridge prices for energy backed by the big industry and by the big trade union. It's exactly the same again. Of course, that is a, long, uh, a topic for a long, long lesson to learn. So it was not uh, as easy as you could say, but you everybody see it, uh, people are dying. And so we had to do something in those days. I was a young man. I was not yet in any uh, position where I could decide and we could make really progress. But at the university, we could do it. We did it. And one of the first answer, what do you believe was, how can you make the air cleaner? It was a high chimney policy. You didn't change the emissions, but you changed the <laughs> chimney. <laughs> was first example for what we call beggar my neighbor policy. And that you can see everywhere, everywhere. You cannot see it, as it mentioned, in the rural district with the emissions of the big industry of coal and steel. I don't want to go to any detail. But of course, SO2 was one of the main topics in those days already, and others as well. The whole line, everything, nothing was clean. So that was uh, the high chimney. The next was, bigger my neighbor, question to you, bring the pollutant industry on the border of your country. So 50% goes to the other one. And please do it in a way that the wind is going to the other side. You can see this wonderful, only one example in the nuclear. The nuclear power plant in France, directly on the German-France border, is Catenau. It's a French nuclear power plant. So if we decide to phase out nuclear, that's not to phase out of the risk of nuclear, because our neighbors is. You know, much later, I was always back from my office in Nairobi, where the United Nations Environment Program is headquartered. In those days, it was, of course, a very, very urgent topic how to, how to handle this. Until today, it is not handled. It is not handled. But we came to a conclusion if you want to go out of nuclear, and we want to go out, that's what I was the head of the so-called uh, ethic commissions by the government, together with uh, Martin Kleiner, the head of the Leibniz Foundation in those days. And we want to go out, and we made a time plan. By the way, the time plan was 2021, exactly in line with what we experienced. But it is wonderful. In the same ethic commission's report is mentioned, if you go out of nuclear power, you must stick to nuclear science. Because I remember very well when we had this disaster of the nuclear power plant in Russia. 
Germans were asked to come to help. I was twice, twice, three times there. We had the topic in the nuclear science. Even if you go out, you cannot go out of science. If you do this, you are a blind man and you can do nothing if everything in Katano, that's Katano, the new power station decided about quite now in different cities in different states in, the, in Europe. I was looking for the water. And luckily this morning, so I have to ask for water. Because... Anyhow, we neglected this. And I'm fairly sure that this is one of the big mistakes we are doing. We have to invest even more in science to be at least in the, able, in the ability to influence in those cases where we have a disaster there. And we have lots of those nuclear power stations. They got my neighbor. I remember I was a minister at the meantime, and I was in those days, as always, in the European Union changing the head of the European environment ministers. And it was concentrated to water. And I was asked to go to Portugal. And a wonderful colleague in Portugal, wonderful wine, by the way. And we discussed and said, I want to see his uh, sewage water treatment plant. He couldn't understand what I mean. They brought the sewage to the shore, had a physical removal, but not a cleaning and say, we have a long tube in the sea. And if you go into sea here at the beach, not a single possibility in chemical pollution outside distribution. By the way, again, we have exactly the same structure where quite now in Japan where they bring the nuclear contaminated water with very long pipeline with tankers out for 40 years, make it at the district and in time everywhere else. So our policy was always more or less bigger my neighbor. And I remember, of course, when I was then able to influence uh, the Conver conference in Rio, 1992, the United Nations Conference on the Environment and Development. By the way, also quite an interesting little experience. We had the first conference of this kind, 1972 in Stockholm. And it was a huge, huge trouble. What's the name of this? Nobody wants to have it, the United Nations Conference on Environment. Of course, the developing countries came back and said, that's idiotic. You destroyed the environment, and we shall come to help you to clean the environment. So at the conference in Stockholm, we had only three.
intensive and not capital intensive. Exactly the other way around in the developed countries. They must be capital intensive because we don't have labor. They have to be not repairable because we are convinced we can do all this perfectly and no problem will arise. And you can go through it. So we have the wrong technologies for the early countries. That was the way that we started. And I'm happy to say this together with my colleague of the Social Democrat Party, Herman Chair, to study the way how can we make renewable energy cheaper. You see, that was <laughs> a hell of a job. When we started with solar energy, we have to pay for one kilowatt hour of solar energy, something about two day mark, uh, one euro. Absolutely too expensive. Where well, we mentioned that we are looking for those energies, we got at the best smiling on the face of the others. Nobody took it serious. And we were convinced if we can go in economies of scale that we invest in more and that we are investing in research, we can have a learning curve like this. And we got it. Now a kilowatt hour of solar energy doesn't cost one euro. It costs one euro cent in the good places in the world. Then you have an answer to this. And what are we doing? We're going now to those countries. Mentioned, for example, Namibia, old German colony. I was there also quite often. <coughs> lots of sun, lots of wind. We try to harvest them and to change it to hydrogen and to export it to the Western countries. This is a new way where we are not thinking first bring the energy to those countries. We are discussing in Germany upside down today, guess yesterday, what's going on with the immigrants. You must go on the roots of this. You must develop those countries. Why don't we have something like a um, seminar for uh, young people, as we have it with also lots of other developed countries? Deutsch, English, Austausch, viele, die hier sitzen. Why are we not educating the people in their countries with the industry? which want to invest there, duale Ausbildung. This is a solution in the, on the roads, you can do it. Then it's not bring them and they go, don't go back. If we now hire the educated people from those countries, that is their capital, their last capital they have. And we, inv we invited them to be here so that we have the possibility to discuss the four uh, days week and uh, working less. That is the problem. Make the other not the uh, slaves of your welfare. We always started with a wonderful saying, we don't want to externalize costs that our prices are highly subsidizing by time and distance. All this is put it out, no, put it in. Bring it to yourself and make science possibility. And this can also overcome to some extent the problems with industry because industry are looking for people working for them. They need, and therefore, if they could do that, as we did it in the very beginning of our uh, vocational training in our country as well, link it with the companies, and then 
go back and make it not linked to a company because then they are not able to be free decision in their perspective for their life. So what you are doing here is not theoretical. So I hope at least. It must be the link between science and politics. And you must be aware, and that's my experience, if you want to do everything at the same time, you're doing nothing, you, make the, you must bring the people with you and not giving them arguments to reject what you are considered to do. I think there's a lot of huge problem in this country, in Germany. So we have come from abroad, you can have not the best things. That's not to praise myself, but of course, we were at the top of the list. Circular economy was started here. I was the founder of the green dot and the yellow sack. So that's always mentioned that he is the green dot. That's better than he is the yellow sack, as you may imagine. <laughs> I could fight at least the second title. <clears throat> you can't fight the first title, the first, first title that are cross the Rhine by swimming. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, see, you, people forget a lot, but this is when uh, I go and I'm coming to the end, somebody will be at my grave with a bottle of water and say, that's Rhine water, he saved it without any doubt. And uh, that is, the by effect of politics. If you are once a politician, you will be it for all the time. Nobody comes back and say that is Mr. General so and so, Klammer auf, CDU, SPD, or sonst was. But when I was mentioned, it's always Klaus Töpfer, brackets, CDU. It seems to be stupid to mention, but it is not because you have to fight against something which is not directly linked with what you believe. It's difficult, really difficult. Not that I'm unhappy with my political decision, but I'm a free man in the decision. And if you are always with this sticker, then you are always in an uphill Better. And therefore, if you want to go to politics, be careful and make it very, very clear that you are still your thinker and not the slave of others. Quite a, quite a challenge. So you see, you can speak a long, long time if you are an old, old man. <laughs> And if you have something like this, because otherwise you have problems with your body, <laughs> and that is not helpful. I'm thankful to you all, of course, to Mark and Jordan. That you came to the good idea to invite me. It's a busy day today, but it is a very good start for a busy day, and therefore I'm happy that I could be here. And I hope that you can overcome the change from ISS. What is that? Rifts <laughs> uh, in the future. Yeah, rifts in the future. There are also wonderful, wonderful gold fingers in the rifts activity. <laughs> and I wish you all the best for your life. And please be always aware. Don't distract from the question, my wisdom. How can I handle it in a broader, open society? How can we overcome this cancel culture, what we see now in this terrible geopolitical disaster in Israel and in uh, the Ukraine, uh, the West Bank, uh, <clears throat> Gaza? what we see in Russia and Ukraine. It is always so necessary. 
so that we can live better on situations in the very beginning. To do it later, we see, is very, very difficult and gives you always the start for the next disaster. And those young people, they want to have a good future and they should have, and you have to work for it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tepfer. I apologize for my poor German English, but I don't speak English any longer. It's, but it changed for the better. But we understood you perfectly. That's a good thing about uh, a heavy German accent um, English like me. <laughs> So thank you very much for your input on geopolitical, uh, political thoughts. And what I took from your speech is and that it's good when you um, studied political science as me to have a, also an economical background, because otherwise you don't understand how it all works. That's um, the thing. Protection of the environment probably doesn't work without um, uh, understanding the economic system. And uh, I really liked your picture from, from the past um, uh, that uh, we have to cut emissions without uh, making the industry building the chimneys higher. I think that's in, in a shortcut uh, what we want to do here at this uh, conference. So please, Nino Jordan, um, come here with uh, me and um, yeah, have a big applause for again for organizing this conference, please. <laughs> So all together, what's your approach with this uh, two days conference and workshops? What's the, the mainly the structure? Yeah, I mean, just a couple of words about the focus of the conference. Um, so thanks everyone for, for coming here, for joining us today here in the, the villa and online. And I promise, I promise I won't try to convince you about a couple of things. I won't try to convince you that this is about a paradigm shift. I'm also not going to try and convince you that this is about a quantum leap. Well, at least not in those words. But I do believe that the developments we're looking at today are potentially a turning point in the history of climate policy. So what are those bold claims about? And the clue is already in the title of the conference, Carbon Footprint Policy Accelerator. So what are carbon footprint policies? I mean. It's, it's great that you all came to this conference, uh, even if you might be clueless about what carbon footprint policies could be about. Carbon footprint policies, what's so special about them? Carbon footprint policies target at least some of the upstream emissions of products, the emissions that accumulate throughout supply chains that are often global. And that is a, that is a true game changer because traditionally climate policy has been focused particularly in the industrial area. Industrial climate policy has been focused on chimneys, has been focused on regulating the emissions where they occur. And then, well, we have lots of social movements, journalists, NGOs, politicians, they all, every, every year there's a new COP and they all in unison declare that one thing is missing, political will. But it's very difficult for politicians to muster much political will if they then talk to industry and industry tells them, oh, if you impose very strict regulation, if you impose high carbon prices, that's just gonna be good for our competitors abroad that are less regulated. So you may, you may uh, regulate us, but actually it doesn't lead to very much. It's just bad for, for the industry that is highly regulated and the other less regulated industry is gonna flourish. So that's a very hard sell for politicians. But here, carbon footprint policies, they come in and they regulate or price emissions wherever they occur in the world. So that's, that's a big change because a, a huge part of that competitiveness argument suddenly loses its force. And so you have, carbon foot, you have a very prominent carbon footprint policy at the level of the European Union, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So they, they try to introduce carbon footprint policies 
by means of pricing. But those developments are potentially quite slow, highly uncertain. And the European Union is never gonna be as ambitious as its most ambitious member states. Conversely, some member states who may lose climate policy ambition may considerably drag down the European Union's climate efforts in the future. So that's why in this conference, we focus on more nimble policies that can be adopted at the level of cities, at the level of US states like California, at the level of US uh, of EU member states such as such as Denmark and the Netherlands. <clears throat> and in the first day today, we focus on the power of purchasing, the power of procurement, be it from public or private sectors. And tomorrow we are going to focus on embodied or whole life cycle carbon regulation in the built environment. So is all this just about construction, the built environment, about steel, concrete, cement, timber, and so on? Partially, that will be good enough because that's a huge chunk of emissions. But I do believe that the experiences from the built environment where carbon footprint policies are the most advanced will also help to inform other sectors such as mobility. So that brings me to the last, uh, to the last bit of the title, the accelerator. What do we want to accelerate? So first, learning about carbon footprint policies. We've, we've, brought, we've brought together uh, people associated with the vanguard of carbon footprint policies today into this room to exchange their ideas, to, uh, to learn new things. And then we also need to accelerate the development of carbon footprint policies. And here it's not just about acceleration, but about accelerating in a smart way, because as Mr. Töpfer just said, if you just if you do so, if you don't do things in the right order, then you might just generate a backlash. So it's really important to look at how can we actually sequence those policies in the right way. So I'm I'm delighted to have this uh, such excellent speakers, facilitators, and participants today, and um, I'm sure we cannot. We cannot but accelerate learning uh, policy development here and also the, uh, the transition to net zero. Thank you very much.